and you're We're on. On the air again. Thank you, uh, Jackson, for being so much of a help on here. But since we are writing books together, you know, it's kind of neat because we can shop talk on all of that. Evolution Hour. We're still in the genetic world. And you're going to hold on to your horses, Jackson. Uh, um, Rupi and Sanford are depending a lot on Sanford to tell him what genetics are in this chapter. <laughs> And they're even dangling because they, uh, they've they even cited um, this uh, Marx anthology that came out in 2013. It was published by a very questionable science publisher uh, over in Asia. But anyway, it, it has a pile up of intelligent design advocates and drum roll. Evolution hour. We're still so, in the uh, genetic uh, world. It's an interesting and you're But anyway, the stuff that I put in initially, again, for all of you who have been asleep in a cave for the last umpteen weeks, I'm going through uh, source by source by source, the Endless co uh, Contested Bones book, uh, where they are objecting, Rupi and Sanford are objecting to uh, evolution of human beings uh, and kind of by implication to everything else, but they're focused exclusively on the human evolution. And they've done a terrible job, as you may have spotted, uh, on the, poly on the, uh, the paleontology and the stratigraphy and the radiometric dating and the whole nine yards. It's just a pile up of authority quotes and vague sourcing and selective blips and all of that and data avoidance. Well, now we get knee deep into genetics. And I was just thunderstruck by this particular bit uh, where um, they just make a big deal. There's only three references on the entire page and I put a, a note up for all of them um, that uh, you could uh, follow them up on your own. The uh, Satterley piece and the methods of the year bit and uh, Gabius's and Roth's paper, all relating to the epitranscriptomic systems, the glycomic systems, the protein interactomic systems, the phosphoratomic systems, and the lipidomic systems. There are countless chemical systems that process the many information systems of the cell. Boom, boom, boom. Which is a fancy way of saying, gee whiz, ain't biology complicated? But the question is, is it evolved or not? And that's the whole point. So one, I thought it was particularly amusing uh, that uh, one of the sources that he puts out, the very first one is Saturday, uh, makes a big deal out of the fact the reason why they want to know how all these complex transcriptome systems and RNA regulators are working is because they can easily tip and generate like Alzheimer's disease and cancers and others, which sounds like you're designing a system that can malfunction a lot. Do, do, do Rupi and Sanford really want to go there? <laughs> when in doubt, it was the fall. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and exactly that would be the case. That's the catch-all on here. But the other point is, is how interesting the science is that that paper on, on the, the, the glycone systems are, are really fascinating. All these little sugar um, uh, systems that are going on in there. And so um, uh, you learn a hell of a lot of material tracking down the stuff that the creationists wave at us thinking, ooh, this is important, without telling us, does it make sense within their creation model? So I'm still awaiting the creation model to come along. Sanford presumably uh, is going to be talking about genetic entropy, I would hope, as a co-author. He's presumably going to be talking about the degeneration that he proposes in the genomes. Um, and we'll find out whether or not they actually get down to that. But in just standing ahead on things is an awful lot of Michael Behe and intelligent design instead before they wind up on that part. So in coming weeks, we'll be able to get into all of that stuff in too. <laughs> your, your comment, because you put in another paper that I stuck into the field as well on this whole bit about um, genetic systems and cancer. Oops, silence. Well, uh, well I, 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 I didn't know that there was a, in. I didn't realize there was a, uh, Oh, lean yeah, lean yeah <laughs> um, uh, I hadn't had an argument with a creationist in a while, and so I very stupidly decided to respond to one left on the one left a comment on the PragerU video. Actually, a bunch of them do that. They seem very triggered by mm -hmm. my video, to use the word that they love. Oh to yeah, use. and so yeah, they uh, they don't really know a whole lot about biology, but no, man, are they no. upset well, about well, something. The Prager video is, is hitting two interconnected trope setups. Prager has a whole cultural network that follow them. And then you've got all the intelligent design groupies uh, that, that bow at the feet of Stephen Meyer. And so you, you have a, plenty of opportunities to trigger. And when you're basically saying, excuse me, but 
Steve has just got his head up his ass here, and then you give the references on it. This is not something that's going to make them feel happy. Well, that's that's <laughs> precisely what, because this guy makes the claim in his original post that ninety nine point nine 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 percent of mutations are harmful, and I said citation please, and yeah. he provided no citation. I think for three comment, three of our back and forths, and then finally. On the last two, he deigns to give two different citations, one of which was just kind of a brief overview of of um, uh, mutation, how mutations work, which didn't say that 99% number. And then the other on one Google. was that one. And so I, I was looking through it, and I was like, okay, this is kind of intriguing. Uh, also, they use evolution in their, their model system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's pulling a, um, a coal. Uh, in uh, 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 dropping a citation that he thinks is helping his case, but isn't. Uh, and I, I always adore uh, uh, those kinds of things because it, that in almost any specific topic that an anti-evolutionist brings up, there is a vast interlocking network of background science. And the odds that, that anybody in doing a quick Google search is going to stumble on the smoking gun of how Darwinism doesn't work uh, because they're not going to find anything. Uh, it means they're more likely to be encountering papers that may sound kind of like what they want. They may have looked through the title a bit or maybe an abstract or um, uh, because it wasn't already in my reference base, uh, it wasn't one that I've encountered in any of the anti-evolution literature so far. So it's probably a Google search and you can always see those ones that they, they type in thing and then they get the little thing and they click on it. They go, aha. And because it's sciencey, I can push it over and the person won't be amazed. They'll just be amazed and throw their hands up in despair. Unless, of course, they know the science. I in actually, which case. Yeah, you're right. Because I, I said, I was like, did you read? Th this is an interesting paper because it ta it's talking about um, uh, mutations that are already associated with diseases yeah. and common polymorphisms. It's not talking about all mutations. It's talking about a set which we know were already yeah. bad. And so it's and like, in particular trying to find out the dynamics of where there are hot spots. Mm -hmm. This is this is the, the bugbear that I'd love to see an intelligent designer ever put their thinking cap on. Michael Behe never did it in any of his writing. Bill Dembski doesn't even get to genetics. Uh, none of them bother about that kind of thing. And that is, how do things screw up? We know that most of the time the system is, is deliciously self uh, homeostatic reliable. That's the reason why everything isn't extinct. It's precisely why genetic entropy doesn't work. It's because everything is kind of kludgy. Uh, 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 kludge, if you're not familiar with that word, I, I'm, uh, I think uh, Daniel Dennett helped uh, uh, popularize in that as well. It's a thing that refers to cobbled together qualities. And what you have is a system of, uh, you want a perfect example illustrating it is the difference between a Model T Ford engine and a, a, a Wankel engine. Wankel engines are clean and if elegant and a simple circular system with very few moving parts. And they are so fussy that you, if you have the tiniest amount of grime or gunk in them, they get into trouble. Whereas the clunky internal combustion an engine with all of its clickety clack and tappet rods and blah, blah 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 and it looks like a mess but boy you can run that damn thing to death uh, i remember we had a, our old um, a chrysler that we uh, a plymouth we, that we drove all the way to california on and had forgotten to put in fresh oil <laughs> and the damn thing hadn't burned out it, it, it the engine was that reliable because it, it's clunky well, what you find in biological systems is that on steroids, because you're looking at billions of years of compensating mechanisms that collectively make this system extremely resilient to perturbation so that the systems will function along and replicate, which makes Richard Dawkins happy. If you successfully replicate, you've won and how you get there doesn't matter. Well, these things have enough little corners in them that that's where screw-ups can occur. And and it's probably no coincidence that a, a lot of the illnesses we deal with as human beings today are around because we've gotten rid of all the things that killed us before. Yeah. So all of those little kludgy malfunction possibilities have a, a clear sailing because you're not dropping dead of diphtheria or a spear in your gullet. Or saber-toothed cats, you know, things like that. <laughs> 
and uh, that that uh, thinking through the the elements of it for a design field um I, I, I like to pay attention. I've, I've been gutting a big stack of stuff in my future notes to pin around with are illnesses that are because biological system is doing does, but has a downside. And this is always the difficulty with anything of, as if you look at it in an engineering context, Boeing is hitting exactly that snag with their attempts to kind of fit around stretching the 737. And it turned out that they stretched it a little too much <laughs> and uh, they can get into a problem where it's actually hard to fly. And so they tried to solve it with a, a software fix, which will work most of the time, except it doesn't, in which case you crash. So uh, that uh, produces a lot incentive. of problems. And uh, biological, yeah, uh, biological systems are supposedly, if they're designed by the super perfect godly designer who can't possibly make dumb mistakes, then how come we see all of this? Oh, Puffalovicus asks, uh, are you aware of any YC arguments against the sentence that we don't have the rest of? Uh, Do we have any? Why? Yes, all of YC arguments uh, are against. So put, it, put in there, Puff, and put in the rest of the sentence on there as to what the... I'm trying to look up. Uh, farther up, mountain upside down, a little bit of Mesozoic. Okay, maybe may talking about uh, geology, which is a perfectly good subject to, to deal with. It's that um, what we're spotting in the rocks were there over and over again is an awful lot of kind of ad hoc response mode to where they, they've got an argument they're trying to dispose of in geology or genetics, and they're trying to do just enough so that it looks good uh, to the reader. Uh, but not necessarily working out what their model is. And uh, uh, Jackson and I are just have been just making so much laughter to one another about how many times the bloody hell creationists can't figure out what their model is and apply it. And the intelligent designer is in the same thing. There we go. We got the other side of the sentence. Thanks, Puff. Where have any YC arguments for the discovery of the first domesticated European cars on the island of Cyprus? Uh, <laughs> oh, cats. <laughs> well, we... we yeah, yeah, that's uh, European. Yes, I, I like the idea of European cars on the island of Being Cyprus. Being domesticated, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was an um, interesting video put out by PBS just a little while ago. Yeah, well, we, you know, we've got uh, a, any one, one of these areas. And creationism, in its broad form, screws up everything. It's almost impossible to find a topic that doesn't come into play as a way of explaining why creationism does, uh, doesn't account for stuff. Because unlike intelligent design, it's extremely tunnel vision and is only looking at irreducible complexity and the Cambrian explosion and the a little bit on biogeography and you suddenly exhausted their entire field. The, the creationists just blunder into everything. <laughs> and sure. so that, that anything in relation to uh, human distribution, human distribution alleles that we have, human distribution in terms of tool use and domestication of crops and, and local rituals, all of that stuff. Human history is big. We've got tens of thousands of years, even though it's not written down. You've got 20,000 years minimum of what's going on in the Americas. You've got 40, 50, 60,000 years in um, uh, Australia, and you've got umpteen longer uh, for the initial dispersal of human beings out of Africa when they spread over into China and all the rest. So you've got a ton of stuff, all of which would have to be accounted for in the creationist model, dispersing from Eden initially, how many people lived outside of Eden, uh, they're very vague about. Uh, uh, you've been reading in there as well. I, I don't know of any spot where a creationist puts the thinking cap on and tries to figure out step by step by step the migration and just and and demographic values of uh, out between eden and the flood and then post flood between them and when we start bumping into more uh, detailed history i don't know any counter example none of them have ever thought about it have yeah. you spotted anything so far yeah yeah not between eden yeah anybody and in, the, the, in the and the feed flood. too if you've encountered 
Yeah, if you if anyone in the live feed knows of anybody anywhere who has ever seen such a thing, please put it give us a link on it. I'll, I'll do a comment on the video and that afterwards on it because we'd love to know. Uh, yeah. It would be a gobsmack watch. Uh, be, you, you, you've you've read enough technical papers, and so have I, where they'll be talking about animal distributions or population distributions, and they've got these global maps, and they're looking at the various alleles or the various cultural groups and tool usages, and you can see the little arrows suggesting that this diffused over into here, or this shifted over to there. That, that there's a, a massive amount of biogeographical forensic analysis that goes on. And there's no counterpart to that in creationism, even though they theoretically have a really detailed world that knows, that there would have been um, a world of undetermined configuration, which may be the one we know, or it may be Rodinia, or it may be Pangea, or it may be some other, we don't know, that was the world that existed at the time of creation, which includes a lot of Precambrian rocks that may or may not have done anything, and then all these animals and plants and floating forests and stuff in this idyllic world without ice ages or any such things are going on with details that we don't really tell about. And there would have been a people breeding like rabbits, producing a lot of people that make the Tower of Babel and do all sorts of nuisances or whatever, and of course bring on the flood. Uh, and no great details about what the hell that is. Then we get to the flood bottleneck. That cleans the deck. The land masses that we didn't specify earlier are going to shift around in some way or another at some speed or another. And big floating forests are going to be landing in certain places that we don't think too much about and turning lickety split into coal seams. And rock is being laid down and turned into rock and then flooded with post floods to make canyons. And all of that's taking place uh, 2350 BC ish or somewhere before or after. And continents are gear shifting around and animals are rampaging off of the flood and going somehow to some places. Those bats that we cover uh, with Kurt Wise uh, going all the way to South America, apparently hanging on to the cacti that they that they feed off of. The koalas uh, were hitching I mean, rides it's, it's on, a uh, on horrible volcanic mess. <laughs> I mean, the koalas were hitching rides on volcanic ejecta at the same time, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah! The little, little koala bears ballistically shot there. Uh, Puff says, uh, you and Jackson should try to get Ben G. Thomas on for an episode. They're right up your paleontological I don't know if they uh, would. The hell? I've literally never seen them or Trey the Explainer interviewed. None of, like, big names in paleobiology. I've never seen them interviewed by anyone. I don't know if it's because... They just choose they, not to? I don't know. I think just aren't homogenic. I think a lot of them just aren't. They're not the sorts that are. You get a few. Um, uh, Paul Serino uh, hasn't really been interviewed all that much, but he does appear occasionally on like Nova shows and things like that. You get a little bit of uh, oh, um, our, our Indiana Jones paleontologist, uh, yikes, with the dinosaurs. Um, and then. And, Robert uh, Bacher? Uh, but. If you think of the number of paleontologists that there are, they're really in their element when they're out in the middle of nowhere digging up stuff. I did and actually it, try to ask, uh, what is his name, uh, Andrea Coe, the paleontologist the other day, if he'd mm -hmm. want to come on. He said he was too busy. So. I tried anyways. That's another factor, yes. They're often very busy. So between the sheer crush of having to work on the next paper and if they have a collegiate environment, they've got to do lecturing and all the other stuff, the kinds of pressures, the active scientists, the last thing they have time for is to go on some YouTube thing. Uh, so I can easily appreciate a lot of that. And the, and the average scientist, e even when you look at, um, I, I kind of bump into it because of the lecture series that they do out at Eastern where they have open seminars that are available to the public and they advertise them and I go every once in a while if they got a, a relevant topic and they do the Darwin Day every year. And um, it's not an easy, easy thing to even do a conventional lecturing mode as you're already aware of in learning the public speaking aspect of it and then to move into a kind of secondary summary analysis thing for non-technical audiences that's even tougher to do
So I don't, I'm not at all surprised that the vast majority of working scientists don't jump at the chance to be on um, a, a YouTube interview under any sort, let alone a debate. On the Most interwebs. Of them just, you know, go, no. Yep, 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 yep. Well, I mean, on the interwebs, yeah. You know, I, I really don't blame them with the debate because, I mean, it, it must feel kind of, uh, kind of silly you know to get on with someone who ah, and the cat jumped off yeah the cat jumped off my <laughs> thing and took my earbuds with it uh yeah it must be it must feel kind of silly to um to go in a yeah. debate up against someone who has no degree in the relevant field they have no no background education in it any of that stuff and so it's like oh, why well, am the, I even the, here? The, the history of debates between uh creationists and uh scientists is a litany of what happens when you get like a gish galloper and obviously gish was a gish galloper with almost anybody that it it's uh if you think about how it is interacting with nephilim or standing for truth or uh, a kent hovind oh, i've forgotten you get an about awful standing. lot of the same tropes uh you get a thing where basically it's a jujitsu of rhetoric uh, and uh, you can't quite get down to where you're actually having a conversation with them. Admittedly, someone like a Fazal Rana or you, Ross, you can actually kind of have a bit more of a serious discussion with. That's Yo, a, speaking of which. That's yes. right. Yeah, on the uh, on the 18th at 5 p.m. Central, he'll be coming on my channel. We're going to talk about common oh, descent. Oh, 18th. Oh, we've got to make a note on that. I, um, I You said, uh, you mentioned that during his talk with Aaron, he said he didn't really think about the... Um, uh, the, the phylogeny challenge. So I was thinking of sort of putting that to him. And so we'll see how yeah, that goes. Yeah. Well, he's not a paleontologist. And even from what little work he's done, um, you might want to check out um, in my tip 1.3, where I go into punctuated equilibrium, I allude to Rana's uh, discussion, uh, which he did in like four postings about punctuated equilibrium. And with that, you practically exhausted his discussion in what way? Ontology. Um, well, he's basically uh, trying to argue that um, punctuated equilibrium is invalid. And he cited two papers that don't discuss punctuated equilibrium at all, and two other papers that explain why it's valid. And um, Rana never actually discusses what his model is and buried down into them. One of them is by Prothero, by the way, I think. Um, that, uh, Who was a student of Niles Eldridge. Yes, indeed. You know, uh -huh. so this is right from the horse's mouth. And Yikes. Prothero, by the way, has written uh, quite a bit on on uh, uh, summarizing uh, uh, for the layman what punctuated equilibrium is all about. And, mm. all of that. and and so if somebody's trying to make an argument on paleontology, riffing off of authority quotes that they've got from anti-evolutionists on this matter, they are doomed when yeah. you suddenly slip into the actual data field. Yeah. No, no he, he's... Uh, a, the two big areas that are surprisingly undercovered in all anti-evolution literature are dinosaurs and, of course, the rhapsids. A plug, evolution slam dunk. Uh, get the get the book and you'll find out about that. But even dinosaurs, you get a bit because now birds being evolved from dinosaurs, there's an in incentive for them to try to undercut that. An awful lot of pot shots at the latest bird fossil, and no, it's not. It's got feathers, but it's actually a flightless bird, and we've got Alan Fiducia from 2002 to say so, and that kind of thing. You get an awful lot of that. I mean, but the yeah. problem is the paleontology just keeps expanding. There was a neat Nova special just uh, last week on uh, the new mammal finds uh, from um, oh god, I think it's uh, Carnage or something like that. Uh, that's uh, up in the uh, the Badlands uh, in Wyoming. And uh, they, they're just going berserk with joy over there because they've been finding tons of the earliest mammals in that like first million years after the KT extinction. And they're seeing this pulse where they're first finding out that um, if, if the place is like devastated. And then you start seeing fungi coming in, obviously chewing up the dead stuff. And then you start seeing ferns pop in and you see a few little straggler mammals that are all very generalists because they can eat practically anything. Those are the ones that survive well. And then in a relatively short space over the next, next million, million years, you find much more adaptive things and bigger critters that are, that are uh, 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 proliferating. And uh, then much later on, then you're going to start uh, seeing the, the ecosystem finally connect up. Oh, but anyway, uh, you know. all the, they had a bunch of paleontologists that they were interviewing on there, many of them quite personable and, and, and camera friendly. Uh, and so you've got a, 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 I think 
as you get more people in the field who are used to YouTubes, who are used to those media things, I think there'll probably be more people that'll, that'll deal with it in the yeah. same way that uh, uh, John Perry and that do it because it's not a weird thing for them. They're not old farts like me, you know, who, oh, okay, my crystal set. No, they're, they're used to it. So uh, that may change and you may get more people who have an ability to do live streaming on the fly in between doing their next paper and all that kind of stuff. So th there's some possible changes in the dynamic there. You know, uh, I, it's, it's not really surprising, I guess, that fungi were kind of the first main things to come back. After all, North America was ground zero uh, after the KT extinction. So Yeah, yeah. And, and they've got fungi are fabulously resilient. This is another issue. We don't know... The fossils aren't detailed enough because they're basically vertebrates and then they're talking about pollen grains and stuff to be able to determine what was going on with the plant life. But a lot of the ones like the insects, um, they're hard to hit. Even the Permian mass extinction just slightly dented the insects. Those arthropods, there's a reason why it's so hard to get rid of the cockroaches in your apartment or the ants on, in the yard outside because they are remarkably resilient and which brings us back to that whole kludge aspect of biological kludge. systems that are extremely resilient to perturbation to where uh, individuals can be creamed off but the system thrives the ecosystem survives the ability to hunker down in the case of disaster and then boost burst out after everything's have settled boom and away you go again well heck fungi uh, been around there's for a billion all this years, biological so, yeah. systems it's, yeah yeah and uh, uh i i think that's a uh, a higher level issue, which will bring us to the second, for once, a non sciencey kind of topic. Uh, let me also put in my little uh, um, uh, thank you for all of our patrons uh, that uh, they're coming up in the middle of the month with a thank everybody on Patreon a bit. And I'll put a big tweet out about this. I can tell you thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody that's been helping already and any more who want to help, well, I'm not going to complain uh, because I can certainly use it. Our colleagues, Hendrel and Eric Rowley and Suris, our researchers level, uh, Travis Adams, Convert Me and Eat Meal and Ralph McFadden and Pelogia and Benjamin Simpson and Ugly German Truths. I don't know if any of them are ugly now. And assistant researchers, Mike Apple and Durunku and James Fitzwater and Tojas Real and our friends Daniel and Stephen Bauman and Mary Gail Beddows and Insects Are Cool and Morton Nielsen and Puffalophagus, who is in the feed, uh, Bo Holbo, Rasmussen and Staggles and Alex Stone and Paul Williams and our legacy patrons uh, who helped when they could, uh, uh, Jan and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Brad and Daniel and Yanya and Sun Sky Stone and Everett and Sewer and Zeshi. Thanks, every single one of them. You've been enormously uh, uh, helpful and I uh, am, am grateful every time the the patreon money lands at the beginning of the month and whoo that been a little easier to make um so uh, all uh, the second topic is what i alluded to in the past that's the whole idea of what if uh scenarios in science uh, and it also pops up in relation to the, the, the gauntlet that Stephen Jay Gould threw down that's causing conniption fits, uh, theoretically, is if you could replay the tape of life and went back to the Cambrian and something happened there and you replaying and it all, Brad, would everything turn out the way it did? Or would things be very, very different, different diff animal distributions uh, of forms where maybe chordates never really got off the ground uh, and, and became a dominant form in their niches or not? And uh, you can't run the tape back, but the whole point is in order to think about that what if counterfactual, you have to really think about how do organisms interact, how do genetic systems function, how do population biology work, how much of it's contingent upon accidents like uh, asteroid impacts or volcanic eruptions and all these other things. And, and, and it's a really tough issue to deal with. There's um, a bunch of fun things that uh, Dougal Dixon has done work on, uh, I forgot about it, I probably should have brought his little book up on uh, um, uh, future dinosaurs. What if dinosaurs hadn't died out and it had survived the KT or if there hadn't have been a KT at all, what kind of critters could have evolved from that? And so you have to ponder all the different kind of weird hypothetical things uh, that uh, dinosaurs might have developed in, a, in an ecosystem that mammals are relatively trivial still and it's a world dominated still by dinosaurs. And so those are all funky things to do. And it, it pops up 
um, in um, both history and in um, uh, science fiction occasionally. Uh, for those of you who um, get your Netflix or whatever the hell it is, uh, they're showing it. The Man of the High Castle, they finally made it into a, a series on that. That was a, a famous, one of the all-time classic alternate universe novels where the Nazis and the Japanese won the Second World War and it's set in an alternate 1962 and it's one of the creepiest, delicious novels and I'm amazed they finally got around to it although I've not been able to see the version of it. Another one that pops up um, uh, from around that same period was Bring the Jubilee which was uh, about uh, an alternate universe in which uh, the South won at Gettysburg and they won the uh, Civil War. And so pondering what the world is in the 1960s where none of the, the United States as we know it doesn't exist anymore. And so to show you just how busy this is, this what if book, <laughs> which is a whole slew of historians and chapter after chapter after chapter of, of speculations on everything from what if Socrates had died earlier uh, and had never gotten in touch with Plato uh, or um, things involving um, the Lusitania and all sorts of, of possibilities. There's endless threads that you can play off of with counterfactual games in history. And, and exactly like the sciences, you have to be able to ponder why are things the way they are? How much is due to human beings individually and how much are kind of bigger forces to where would there have been a world war one anyway because of, of interlocking alliances how so that ultimately is what is the role of the individual versus the the, the, the is there a, a stream of history that you're going to have and these are things that, that nobody knows the answers to because we can't replay the time field but you can separate out the people who think through carefully uh, versus the ones that are kind of superficial. And uh, I remember back in the uh, 60s, back when uh, public broadcasting was just starting, there was a series that uh, was on where some uh, very pompous uh, historians, including Susan Sontag, but it was an interesting show. I was fascinated by it. Uh, back in the black and white days would get on, and I can't even remember the title of the damn thing, but they would be uh, talking about these hypotheticals in exactly that for like a half hour. And anybody that remembers the old Saturday Night Live from the 1970s, one of the routines they would do was a parody of that bunch. And they would have uh, uh, these, these pompous historians getting in and they would be talking about what if there were B-52s at uh, the Battle of Agincourt? And so, <laughs> which was not the kind of counterfactuals they were dealing with. You know, those are, are, are over the top counterfactuals. But the, the, the tiny ones are, um, uh, oh, you could think the assassination of Franz Ferdinand in World War I was in part occurring because the driver didn't know Sarajevo streets very well and got lost going back to the railroad station and had to think about where he was going and stopped the car and looking around for the proper direction. And they, they stopped right in front of the cafe where Gavrilo Princip had been nursing a, a drink because he didn't have a chance to attack uh, Franz Ferdinand. And suddenly there he is, bang, bang, kills him and his wife and starts World War One. Well, what if that hadn't happened? And so you can ponder how much of, would something else have triggered off World War One, and might it have occurred later on? Um, uh, have World War One occurred too early? You would have had uh, everybody running out of ammunition if it had been occurring in the 1890s because nobody had a way to manufacture endless supplies of, of uh, nitrogen um, because they didn't have the Haber process available. So all of those things are now changing the dynamics of stuff. And it's funky how easily counterfactual models get in a lot of science fiction stories without them thinking through the implications of them. And so that's another, and, and you probably stop me if I'm just rattling on far too much on this, but just imagine um, a, a, an atomic powered trireme at the Battle of Salamis. Okay, fine and dandy, you've got atomic power triremes. How do you do atomic power in those days? If you have atomic power, why do you have the atomic power running the ores? In other words, if you have one technology, 
why did you have another? You get into this well, in Star Wars. Yeah, isn't that which kind is, of the whole uh, of not like a counterfactual? A, isn't that like all of all of steampunk? You know, you've got this yeah. very this very uh, advanced technology, but also lots of wood and you know stuff like that. It's like why? Mm -hmm. Well, wow. yeah, a lot of it is aesthetic. And, and as somebody who has written a quasi steampunk novel, uh, The Paralogues of Phileas Fogg, another book to get for your uh, uh, holiday pleasure, uh, Paralogues of Phileas Fogg, I um, try to avoid the excesses of steampunk. You get uh, some of this in some of the Japanese anime where there's just over the top, there's fleets of giant airships and, and a lot of steam powered stuff. Yeah. And uh, and you have to think about or that one that fabulous machines thing. I haven't had a chance to see that that one that tanked at the box office, the uh, Peter Jackson movie about these uh, gigantic uh, cities that they put up on wheels and they roll all over the place. Oh, and, I heard about that. Uh, yeah, I never saw it. Yeah, it just it bombed. Visually very impressive. But the thing is, is that you can get caught up in the the visuality and the details of it. And uh, when you think about um, uh, one of the tropes that you find in an awful lot of steampunk fishing, they've all got to have bloody airships. There's right. just fleets of airships all over the place. And yet yeah. everything about it stays the same. So there's this this Wild West set thing, set piece, where the, the, the cliche of the, of the barkeep and all this kind of stuff and the characters are coming in and having all this period thing and then they're going to be talking about catching the airship to some distant place the existence of the international airship network changes the dynamic of the culture yeah. to where you won't have the same kind of a culture that you would have in a, a, a out of the play way place in 1870 where the only way you can get your fresh booze is from the railroad train that's 20 miles away from where your bar is as opposed to the airship service that can fly it in from Europe and drop it off at the aerodrome five miles away. You know, in other words, you get a whole different dynamic going on. And uh, that's why speculative fiction of where you try to figure out what are the implications of technology are really fraught with peril. Because uh, in Star Wars, here you've got a culture that has anti-gravity systems and they have Imperial walkers. What the hell is wrong with this picture? <laughs> well, actually, I, there's an argument to be made for the whole of Star Wars that the technology does not evolve. At like, yeah. if you look, if you look at the, um, and there are videos on this. I think Geesley put out one of them, but I've I watch a lot of Star Wars videos on YouTube. But one, uh, I remember watching one where they talk about how, uh, even though there's there's sort of a an assumption of the evolution of technology, there really isn't though because you're using the same type of of weapons in like every war uh you yeah. know the same type of tanks and also and soldiers and all sorts of stuff so yeah and and uh, i I'd, I'd have to put in a connection on this the futures that that turned out to be wrong uh you could do a whole film festival of the futures that never happened uh look at the future of 2018 in back to the future 2 we're past oh, it now. Man. It's the past. 2015's gone. Yep. And uh, likewise, uh, we're about to hit the 2020s, where you can compare that with Metropolis, that's set in 2020, the old classic Fritz Lang um, um, dystopian future. Uh, 2022, I think, is when Blade Runner is set. Uh, things to come. Um, uh, of course, already, if you're familiar uh, uh, with uh, that's H.G. Uh, Wells' only um, a science fiction film he wrote that came out in 1936, and some of it's just eerily prescient. Uh, it has World War II starting in 1940, and the Germans are bombing London, and everyone's running down into the subway lines, and, and the audiences are roaring with laughter at how ridiculous that sounds, and Arthur C. Clarke is going, hey, maybe not. But then the world turns very different as it's kind of a replay of World War I and there's gas warfare and trench warfare and civilization breaks down. And then all these uh, 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 mob lords, guys, all the technocrat airmen uh, from Baza down on the Persian Gulf where the oil fields are in Iran, um, gradually spread civilization again. And, and then the main story at the end takes place in 2035 when everyone has their flat screen television sets uh, and uh, are, are thinking about um, sending the um, space exploration. And they're now talking about whether that's a good idea or not. You know, it's a, it's a mind boggler of a plot line on there. But the, the details of how uh, 
it's so hard to predict the future to where it's very, very difficult, even for science fiction writers, to uh, anticipate the impact of all those interactive technologies. I mean, look at, look at your smartphone. It's, a, it's an ubiquitous device that virtually nobody thought about. It, it was easy for people to think about homicidal HAL 9000 in 2001. Arthur C. Clarke could imagine artificial intelligence. The idea that people would have portable computers they would carry around with them. <laughs> well, didn't uh, uh, Star is, Trek is, didn't, uh, have like flip phones? Well, the, yeah, and, and that, in fact, the people who invented the flip phone deliberately wanted to make a thing that looked like the flippy thing in the Star Trek communicator. And then by the time you move to the new next generation, it dawned on them, okay, if we have a computer system like this, why can't we just have a little touch thing and don't have to have a thing we open up? So that's actually getting to wearable technology. Uh, the same thing with the replicators. Uh, that uh, 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 if you think about what a transporter does, it disassembles you and puts you back together again. Why can't you just put the put together again thing? Why can't you take direct energy and simply manufacture a cup of Earl Grey tea, which is what the replicator is. So it, that's a bit of the thinking through the technology part, but it's extremely difficult. Uh, anybody that wants to try to play this thought experiment game, just go through and watch the old connection series. Uh, that James Burke did, which everyone should watch anyway because it's the best science series ever on, on the role of technology, uh, that um, explains how accidental, here's where very Gouldian, Stephen J. Gouldian, about the role of technology and individual invention. It's that so many things almost happen or happen because somebody else did something over in the next county that somebody takes on. Who could have looked at a, uh, a perfume atomizer in 1880 and say, well, that's going to be how the fuel is sprayed in automobile engines in the 20th century. There you go. Um, that nobody can anticipate all the interacting uses that technology comes up. So, and now imagine how much more difficult it is trying to think through the interactions of thousands or millions of species composed of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of, of, of individuals with their own genomes that can be X number of chromosomes and so many billion base pairs, all interacting in an ecological system that's operating with predator-prey relationships and then moving on land masses that are slowly shifting because of plate tectonics and then altering because of the fact that the solar system is orbiting the galaxy. And so every 400 million years, you're in and out of galactic cluster zones where you're getting slightly different supernova. Band. Try working all that out. And yeah. anticipate what the next million years of life would be if we suddenly dropped dead. No, it's impossible. There in was principle. a show. There Your was brain a just goes. Show, Boom. There was a kid show. I remember that. Uh, it, like these kids were looking for. Uh, it's like there's a some sort of uh, calamity in modern day, and so these kids mm. were going to the way far future to to bring humans to the future because that was a good idea. Um, but so they're looking at different ecosystems, <laughs> like a million years on, five million years on, and they're talking about the different organisms that are living there. And it's it's like the plants always look the same, but it's the animals that are completely different. It's like why? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that and for the same reason that aliens tend to look like people in suits, because right. you, you uh, and now it's different now that you can do digital animation. Uh, Vesta asks, uh, when are the rocks uh, where they're coming out? Well, volume one should be out by Christmas. Uh, I'm just finishing up my end of our final chapter of volume one. We decided to split them into two volumes. And uh, then I, um, was knocking at the door. Uh, we're adding a second uh, of appendix, which will be a listing of the phyla. And uh, I'm going to be adding in some material on that because it suddenly dawns on me. It may be an interesting thing to ponder the order in which phyla were discovered in relation to whether they have a good fossil record or not. And how many of the of the recent phyla are all living phyla? They're not really typically fossil ones. Yeah. And uh, it's partly because of how difficult it is for um, small, squishy little organisms uh, to be preserved. And so you don't know whether you're still missing any even now. Oh yeah, I was um I put or we we put a list together um I think it was last week uh all 34 
animal or all 34 animal phyla that we're aware of and yeah. the first appear and their first appearance in the fossil record and there are nine phyla that don't have fossil records at all and a number yeah. with kind of questionable fossil records especially if they're like little wormy things some of them are just trace fossils inferred i know there's at least yeah. one phylum that probably was around in the cambrian that is known only by the wiggles it's making on the surface well, hey. that are like the ones that are made by that phylum of animal so they zoom that maybe it is one but Close that one. if you're a, a creationist you'd have to go well you can't prove any of that were you there well, the kind of doozy of a book there, and um, uh, when it dawned on us that, that we could do it in two volumes because it is such a massive work and that the second volume has a good balance of material in it. There's still material on flood geology, and then we got cosmology and human evolution. So a lot of the, the, the there's a lot of crossover details that we were going to be hitting on in various chapters anyway uh, that, yeah, let's split it up and uh, turn it into two books, and that gives a little bit more money for people to buy. Uh, for two books instead of one, but it's also frees us up to where we wouldn't have to go into panic triage mode to figure out what we want to cut to trim it down to a manageable size length. Because everything that we've been doing, we like. <laughs> we like what we're saying, and and we're we're cut, touching on so many different areas that that if for those of you who have read uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, and for those of you who haven't, what's stopping you from getting it? Uh, that um, that just when you think there is a like you've encountered everything stupid that creationists could possibly say on the fossil record and biology oh you ain't seen nothing yet oh no <laughs> yeah i was <laughs> honestly disappointed at one point when bodie hodge and georgia purdom made the crocoduck argument i thought yeah. with these are people uh, who yeah. at least well at least georgia does who have some knowledge more than Ray Comfort does, and they yeah. still pulled the crocodile. They argument. still well because it's it's the trope. The reason why the crocodile sounds attractive to the grassroots creationist is because they try to imagine uh, what a transitional form is going to look like, and because they know diddly squat about the area, they think, okay, what would a a crocodile and a duck? A bird. Well, well, there you go. You just take the head of one and put it on the body of the other, and that would be a transitional. Well, and know, that's exactly not what you did. I think it's funny because it seems like the one person who actually tried to figure out what a transitional fossil would look like was Ray Comfort. So, <laughs> well, yeah, and and what, what's fascinating about it again, this is an issue of where you got to be careful about where you're going in that. The, the paleontology can get ahead of you to where your argument becomes irrelevant. Right. Uh, that uh, in bird evolution is the classic example of the generations of people, both evolutionists and creationists, were batting their heads trying to think about a, a partial wing, possibly have developed partial wing. When we're looking at it from the 21st century and going, we don't need a partial wing. The damn theropods developed a long arm that naturally moved the way the wing does and then add feathers and now you have a selection pressure for flapping and finally some that become specialized over and over again, multiple lineages were developing these damn flyers of which only one group, the ornithines, made it through the KT extinction, which is begs another question which brings us back to our what if scenario of in fact birds are a perfectly fine example how the re why is it that the enantronithines didn't make it through the kt none or, of them or the, uh, them? or the bat theropods yeah yeah the um uh oh a td line says the real crocodile would look something like a smaller crocodile if i remember correctly well what they what, what they created was a chimera to where yeah. it was a crocodile head photoshopped into a little duck body well ducks are derived birds that have pick styles and the whole nine yards they're way diverged from the thing and a crocodile is an archosaur which although dinosaurs are in the archosaur grouping they're highly specialized ones and what we're talking about is that that we don't need to think about the common ancestor between a crocodile and a bird is way deep in the diapsid line 
that those archosaurs that lead off to crocodiles and pterosaurs and that bunch are not the line that leads to dinosaurs and birds. That's a highly specialized uh, thing that's going on in there. But the fascinating thing is, is if you've got, is it that in Antornithines, uh, which uh, the fancy word for uh, the opposite of birds, that's what it literally means. And it's because their shoulder blades, uh, one of them, instead of the socket being this shape, the, it's the thing that's the other shape, it's, it's backwards. And, and we have no fossil data to clarify what was the split that generated the enantronithines versus the ornithines. And so creationists can still come in there, well, there's another gap that you need to fill. Well, maybe the fossil genie will come good on it. But nevertheless, the, the enantronithines are intriguing because they dominated the Cretaceous. Uh, there are is a lot of, of, of good evidence that some of the ornithines were coming on the scene by the time of the KT, but they were minor players on a, on a, a bird landscape dominated by these enantronithines. And yet all of those, whoop, no, no. is it that they became too specialized and we're now connecting too well with the dinosaur ecosystem, whereas the ornithines were kind of outliers that had to be a little more generalist and generalist were the ones that made it through the extinction. That may be the solution to it. So if anybody has encountered some technical literature that's speculated on this point uh, at that level that I may not be aware of, uh, shoot us our way because anything dinosaur related, I'm interested in anyway. Uh, that's why I love to get on the dinosaur turf because I, I'm not interested in dinosaurs in order to cr attack creationists. I'm interested in dinosaurs because I'm interested in dinosaurs. And so I, I there's no, you don't have to prod me. Oh, RJ, you want to study some dinosaurs? Oh my. Oh, I am so belabored to have to, no, just let me go. And I'll be uh, interested in it anyway. And it's a fascinating area. And I'm like a kid in a candy store in, in the fact that the revolution, and you've spotted this as well, I'm sure, in your uh, work, the amount of information that's available now on the paleontology and the biology of stuff directly relating to dinosaurs is just gobsmacking. Well, I mean, nasty. heck, RJ, we did a five-part series on dinosaurs. So. Yeah, it, it, it's and you couldn't have done that. Um, even now to where uh, I remember I'm old enough to remember when carnosaurs were a generic group. Well, heck, I still have books that mention or that talk about carnosaurs being a group. Yeah, yeah, and and that's and based on the limited information that they had available back in the eighties, um, it, it wasn't at all clear. Well, along comes those damn cladists and Paul Serenders who are starting to look at them and, and putting the data field into the maw, and they go, no, actually, there's three independent. Uh, there's these, uh, oh God, I tell you, that, uh, in the, in the Triassic, the first really big ones. And then the allosaurs that are uh, typically ones with, uh, a fairly well-developed fingers on their hands. Um, uh, Megalosaurus and others, allosaurs, they were, they were the dominant ones in the Jurassic in particular. Uh, and that's a separate line completely from the Tyrannosaurs. And the Tyrannosaurs turn out to be jumbo Solarosaurs that they were just a, a niche group of theropods that really went big. And they have, uh, although there are some smaller varieties that are actually known, and uh, they became the dominant uh, a predator uh, of their particular well, niches. Well, they're pretty interesting. Um, I'm not sure how many of the ones. Yeah, oh, fascinating. Because they they're were, the um, they and, and couldn't actually get off or get to their big sizes until the acrocanthosaurs, who are a later group of, of allosauroids, were wiped out by the mid-Cretaceous extinction. Yeah, yeah, you got, and so and that's another feature that a lot of the things, if you if you don't look at the details, you don't realize that you have shifting ecosystems going on. And so that predator-prey relationships can be altered by uh, environmental shifts uh, in there. Uh, in fact, um, uh, they're still probably tinkering around with the impact of uh, all of the Deccan traps and how they were destabilizing the ecosystem that way. Uh, and then finally the KT extinction comes along with the asteroid splat. But um, it, it's that, I think somebody pointed out that most of the people who are dinosaur paleontologists are alive today. And it's like, and most of them are remarkably young and so we're going to be at it for quite some time. So um, uh, any creationist out there that think you're going to explain the dinosaurs and you haven't so far because the data was already too big for you, it's only going to get worse. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, I'm not uh, not expecting a, a monograph on dinosaur phylogeny. So. Yeah, yeah, and and that's true of everything else. Um, uh, my uh, routine that I will point out to everybody is nobody needs to be a polymath in this area, although I'm not going to complain if you are. Uh, but the thing is, is that everybody can find an area if they want to engage on creationism that they know and that they're naturally curious with. Uh, I kind of got into the to the reptile mammal transition thing just by the fact that I noticed that, that creationists were so reluctant to discuss it. And then, of course, because it turned out that as I looked deeper and deeper into it and found that you had examples that were predicted in a way that you didn't have in the uh, dinosaur uh, venue and that there weren't the holes in the phylogeny gaps that you find. You don't have the counterpart of that mid to early Jurassic period where you just don't have a good data field to figure out what the hell was going on before Archaeopteryx. It's a very murky period. We don't have any spots like that of any note in the reptile mammal transition. And then we've got the, the smoking gun of the double jawed forms that are way, uh, birds are so boringly modified theropods that there's no gradation issue there that actually the creationists can exploit to where they can say, well, those aren't actually anything new. They're just, those feathered theropods are just flightless birds, you see, and that, and they can keep their pigeonholes that way. The very fact but that they can the reptile do mammal transition involves, oh yeah, well, it's, it's, it's amazing the dodges you get into. Uh, on and it, it, but the thing is, is with the reptile mammal transition, is you've got that blatant gear shift between a multiple jaw dentary bone system, and then the dentary only on a completely different skull bone in the mammal, and that's that is a really big uh, shift. And to see step by step by step exactly how that turned out, and it matches exactly the model that was developed on evolutionary grounds by Robert Broom, means that if it was designed, God really wants us to believe in evolution, because it went out of their way to fill in that you know, of, a, of a predicted critter on a scale that has no counterpart in the bird evolution or whale evolution or any of these other things. So it's, it's just the slam dunk. And it was literally the thing that turned me into an evolutionist because when I found out about the reptile mammal transition, I'm going, well, that settles that. I mean, wow, well, that uh, settles. you really can't deal with that. But yeah, because it was a thing that, 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 that you, it's so gratuitously evolutionary, the steps that you can see. So uh, that you'd have to be a malicious cheat of designer that's just going, oh, I'm gonna put this in there because boy, is that gonna make those evolutionists happy. Well, that's dumb. RJ, he's uh, testing so, uh, his true believers. Yes, indeed. Yes. Ad hoc explanation and dodge number eight. They have to be able to reject all of reality. <laughs> well, as we have seen from the readings that we have done, rejecting reality is a skill they have down. <laughs> yeah, that that is pretty true. So. Yeah, and the the other thing that I can do if you want a take home phrase is that if all you know about evolution is what you read in anti-evolution literature, you won't know a hell of a lot. Because in every, in every possible venue, and this is what makes people like George Purdom, uh, Andrew, not knowing, uh, is because they should know better. They, they can't possibly claim that, they don't, that they're unfamiliar with the data field. And so their inability to address that data field is a dead giveaway of what's going on as the information is deflecting off of their mind shell. And then it percolates down to Answers in Genesis chapters where you're just head scratching as to how sparse the documentation is. Did, did it impress you how few citations there were in, in those Answers books? Not really. I mean, uh, having read Slam Dunk before I read this, I was not hugely surprised that there's like one citation per every few pages. <laughs> so yeah, and and it's if you think about it as to what their their audience is though, it's understandable because they're writing very thinly structured apologetic summaries, where they kind of allude mainly to themselves incestuously, and they certainly don't want to cause the the audience to just get all pushed out of shape uh, with too many of those footnotes. 
Uh, so they, they're very, very sparsely documented in that in that realm. But it doesn't get any better when you move over to their their heavy guns. And we we like to play both off against each other in the Rocks book because we'll be talking about the material from the answers chapters directly, and that leads us into the more precise technical material. So we're not merely filleting Andrew Snelling uh, in his brief co uh, contributions at that higher level, but also Andrew Snelling doing the more detailed papers, uh, the stuff they put in their conferences and all of that, which a huge chunk of it's directly available. Some of the stuff um, uh, is harder to find. Uh, I fortunately had the advantage of having the both of the rate books, which are on radiometric dating things. I happen to acquire them at like a bargain sale. Uh, so I only like to pay like, no, I think ICR put them on sale. Uh, so I think I've only paid like about 10 or 15 bucks or something like that for the two of them. I mean, it was just a ridiculously small amount of money for these great big monstrosities. And and the having that primary source data to where you can look at point by point by point, then you can start looking to see how the shell game is made and how they're constructing what sources they're paying attention to and what they're evading. And uh, it, I found in my um, uh, field that nothing is more valuable than having the creationist paper up and the technical paper they've just cited. And then you can see exactly how it's used in the creationist work. And then you can look at the content of the original paper and see how they don't mention all of the points that are relevant and then you got them <laughs> yeah they uh so it's, um it's, it's, it's we have pretty anything? silly how much they miss yeah the um um uh, bj is, is, is all she learned about ev evolution in seventh day adventists is how science got it wrong the, the the adventists are immensely influential in that area today uh an awful lot of what passes for creationist uh paleontology is done by Adventists. Um, just check to see the ones that are at Loma Linda University. That's one of their fields. Even though an awful lot of modern Adventists aren't as up on young earth creationism, it's kind of becoming a looser dogma. Um, it's it still had enormous influence. And that version of things that was being done in Adventism filters into the young earth creationist apologetic literature all the time. So keeping tabs upon what the Loma Linda set does um, can relate to what goes on the broad text over at Answers in Genesis and ICR and the uh, Christian Science Quarterly and all of that. There's still, it's also amusing that there are like about half a dozen creationist journals that pass themselves off as technical journals and, you know, they have a lot of footnotes, so they must be. Um, whereas intelligent design has just dwindled down to just, just biocomplexity. That's it. <laughs> yeah, and even Oh, Lisa, is... um, uh, uh, love to interview you for my channel i'm open yeah i have no problem with that as you as you can see i'm a shy and retiring wallflower who is just positively uh not talkative <laughs> yeah everybody a, we I have, that if you've got questions creation evolution issues shoot them my way i love to answer them yeah it's uh it it has been kind of funny how if you look at how much they bring up in their chapters versus how much we bring up in our chapters, uh, they're kind of missing a lot of data. So, oh, good gravy! Yes, and and, and um, is that as that one thing that uh, you learn so much create uh, science by watching creation videos? Um, it's not because they have knowledge in them; it's that they stumble into areas that you then research. Uh, one of the ones that I just finished up um, was the overthrust section, uh, which sounds like a, a, a porn topic, but in fact relates to these rock formations that slide down or are pushed over onto um, younger rock. And creationists, of course, are saying, oh, this is a terrible circumstance. But for some weird reason, they tend to associate with volcanic active zones. And so it turns out that that's part of the impetus of it. And the other issue is heat. It, interesting things happen. Here's the, the, the cute skitty. If the rocks heat up to like 708 or 800 degrees centigrade and, and the rocks that are being pushed are limestone, limestone at that temperature calcinates and turns into like a carbon dioxide lubricant <laughs> that 
can allow the rock formation to move on top of it like a skateboard. Uh, and uh, it's quite amazing. And so it's no coincidence that a lot of these deposits are relating to limestone, um, sedimentary rocks. They're not volcanic rocks on top of other volcanic rock as a rule. And so there's a, a bunch of, of wonderful examples of um, uh, the Hart Mountain is the mother of all landslides. And you so got stuff out in the Norwegian Sea uh, where uh, I think what it was 640 cubic miles of rock moved in like a few minutes about 8,000 years ago and set a catastrophic tsunami all over the Northern Sea area because they've got the washes of it where it hit the land and they even found that there was a whole community of moss that got killed in the slosh and basically buried them in one fell swoop and so they are trapped. So it tells you the ecology of the climate at that time and their little radiocarbon clocks start ticking. <laughs> so you're able to um, uh, date them with great precision. And uh, needless to say, that's one that has not been discussed by the creationists whatsoever. Uh, it's, uh, it was shut off on there. Cool and one in Iran, a great big landslide in Iran that took place about a year, 10 years ago. So um, it turns out that these big landslides are not as uncommon as we would like to think. And of course, one in the making um, uh, over in the Madeira Islands, I suppose I should stick that in, um, where uh, periodically um, the, the real estate there shakes and it slides stuff down into the water. And it's a big chunk of stuff. And you can produce like 800 foot tidal waves where New York is today. So uh, I probably wouldn't want to be living anywhere on the East Coast, just in case Madeira decides to landslip again <laughs> out in the Atlantic Ocean. So that shows you how one thing can connect unto another. Well, we are past the hour. Um, we've uh, uh, I'm I don't shocked. see any questions shocked. in the live chat. Uh, there's another thing. So uh, play around with the what if games, ponder in history or in science. What would, it, what would it be if something were different, some characteristic? And then you have to ponder what impact that would have. Uh, and in a way, that's where that old anthropic reasoning comes about, because they ponder what would happen if the carbon constant were different or something like that. And therefore, you don't get planetary systems and all sorts of stuff pops up. Um, that's actually a, a thing thought experiment because it forces you to study what the science is, history, and figure out how things interact and function to be able to play the speculative what if game. So that's a, a take home, it's a parlor industry. You could do that. Hey, instead of doing pin the tail on the donkey, you know, uh, play the um, what if game uh, that, um, uh, in any area whatsoever. So uh, I guess we're done for the week. There's the only one that I won't be doing, will be during the Thanksgiving week. And then there will be another one, maybe one or two weeks, maybe in the holiday period when uh, Christmas holidays, when I may not be doing an evolution hour. But uh, other than that, you ain't going to get rid of me anytime soon and help out with Patreon or uh, GoFundMe. There's links in the in the video on that. Uh, every little bit helps. And there's a lot of woo still to fight. Well, so we will have our new book out uh, with Jackson by the end of the year. And then the second volume will get out in 2020. And then there's projects beyond that. You already promising 2020, RJ. Well, I guess we. I had I had to add a new column to my my master spreadsheet when I first started it in 2009. I I left one for the 2010s, and now I'm realizing, oh uh oh, I need another column for the 2020s because I keep track of the time frames of the things to see the, the mix of how much of the material. I think like about 80% of my uh, material is since 2000. So it's it's a, a commonplace thing. And then also to spot how much of it comes from the 70s or 80s, I track it back through the 1960s. And then beyond that, the period um, into the uh, early 20th century and then the 19th, and 19th century or earlier. Uh, oh, uh, TV Lane says, good night, uh, Jackson. We is going up to dig up some trilobites. Oh, good old trilobites. Yeah. Those damn trilobites, they had a good run, but they're all extinct now, damn it. God obviously took a disliking to them. Oh, well. They, uh, so, they made see you next set. week, gang. <laughs> all right, and stopping the stream.